Right, so first I'll introduce myself. I'm Andy Gosser. I'm a mentor on Team 7028 out of St. Michael Albertville High School. Um, I'm a software developer by trade, and this is my fifth year with FRC. We were a rookie team in 2018, and I've been with the team ever since. So this is the FRC Java programming course. Hopefully you're in the right place. Um, we're going to look at some of the tools on the setup, try to get you know the basics from the ground up. What does the life cycle of a robot look like when you're programming? What is command-based programming, and why would we want to use that? And then we'll even look at the simulation a little bit if we have time. So I've got some slides we'll go through. They're, they're pretty light and we're gonna actually dive into Visual Studio Code. I'll try to show you some of the buttons to click and ways to run things. And certainly you can put questions in the chat at any time and I'll try to address those and I'll try to give a pause now and then for questions as well. So WPI Live is the main core of what we program with. So, you know, we're gonna program in Java, but we have a library that we use that provides all of the framework for how to interact with a robot. So you'll get used to seeing WPI Live when you're looking for stuff on the internet on Google, include the term WPI Live, you find what you're looking for. The primary development environments are Windows. Uh, the primary development environment is Windows. You can also develop on Mac and Linux, but you can't, control the robot from those to be able to use the driver station and run the robot, you have to be on Windows. And Chromebooks aren't supported because you can't really install things on those at this point, other than you know what's on the web. So it's really Windows is what you want to look for, Mac and Linux if you need to. The installer that you would download from WPI Live includes everything you need for programming. So you get Java, Visual Studio Code, the Gradle, which is the build and deployment tool, and you get a local copy of the documentation too. So if you want to look at the documentation website, you can do that without having internet yeah. connection. Um, so over, we have a video, or uh, not a video, a uh, screenshot there of the installer. It uh, downloads Visual Studio Code, and then you can choose the things you want to install. Usually we just install everything. You can leave out the C++ compiler if you're only going to use Java. Um, and it installs into a new folder each year, so you can have more than one year installed on the same machine, which sometimes is handy if you're doing off-season and, and different things like that. So Visual Studio Code is the Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. Um, so this is a screenshot of it here, but we'll, we'll dig in there a little bit, but that's where you do your coding. That's where you test your code, you deploy it to the robot. And if you wanna step through or see log messages, you can do all of that in Visual Studio Code. So let's jump over to Visual Studio Code and actually see what does it really look like. So um, hopefully my screen switched and you can see now a dark mode uh, Visual Studio Code. This is what it looks like, great. This is what it looks like when you don't have any project open, but some of the things to look at, there's the Explorer over here, which kind of shows you what you have open, um, different tabs over here that you can click on to see different things in that area. So you can do a search. Um, if you're using Git or other source control, it has integration for that. And the debugger, this other stuff we usually don't have to worry about much. This is the primary tab you'd be on up here with the list of files. This section down here is the terminal. If you're you know, used to typing commands, you can do that in there. But also when you do a build or deployment, you wanna watch what happens down here because it'll give you errors if your code doesn't build or if it does build successfully, this is where you'll see that. So there'll be a bunch of stuff that scrolls by here that you're usually not that concerned about, but when something goes wrong, this is one of the first places to look. And then also sometimes down in this, bottom status area, you want to keep an eye out because if it's working on something, there'll be a little spinner down there. It won't you know, block the whole screen with like a pinwheel. It'll show up down here. So if it seems like things are kind of just not working right, maybe something's not loaded, look down there and see if you see that little pinwheel. That means it's still working, especially on slower machines or the first time you open it, you'll see that. And then 
the way WPI Live integrates with Visual Studio Code is through this command palette. And there's two primary ways to open that. One is by clicking the little W button at the top, and then it'll show you a list of WPI commands. Or you can push Control, Shift, and P at the same time, and then you get that same list. So we'll use some of these commands as we go through, but that's how you open that. Um, so various things in there. So then let's jump back over to the slides and take a look at what is the life cycle of a robot? Because you have to understand that if you're going to start programming. So a robot will go through different states when you turn it on. It's first in the initialized state. So the robot will start up. It'll run any code that you have in your initialized. That's where you'd want to set up, um, you know, set up your motor controllers and things that you only want to happen one time. When the robot starts, you do an initialized. And then it, once your initialize is done, it immediately goes into the disabled state. So in your disabled state, usually you don't have to have much code in there. But if you maybe have lights or you know something fancy that you want to do when the robot is disabled, that's where you would put that code. And then during a regular match, it will go to autonomous next. And if you're familiar with how an FRC event works when you play the game the first 15 seconds are autonomous so you're you don't use any controllers the robot has to drive by itself when it's in autonomous we can put our code there in that autonomous section and it'll only run that and then after that 15 seconds is up your robot will automatically go into the teleoperated mode and that's where you would read um, joystick input or xbox controller input and make your robot do stuff and then when it's done with teleop, it goes back into disabled. And I have a line there. It could go from autonomous into disabled. If your robot, um, if you shut it off or if you disable it, stop it, it can go back from autonomous into disabled. Um, also, for testing purposes, you can skip autonomous and go straight into teleop. That's you know a lot of times what we do in the shop. You don't want the robot to go driving off by itself. You just want to drive it around. So you can go straight from you know disabled to teleop and back. So command-based programming is what we usually want to do in FRC. A command would be a Java object that performs a task from start to finish. And you can think of the command as being what the program should do, not necessarily how it should do it. So a drive forward command would be an example. The robot would drive forward a set distance at a set speed. The command would just know that I need to drive forward, I need to keep track of how much time or how much distance, and then I need to tell the robot to stop. And you can group commands together into command groups to have more complex tasks. So you can do things in parallel or you can do things uh, in a sequence. So if you think of um, like, not a robot, but let's say I'm gonna walk three feet forward, that could be a command, right? And then, I can use a command group to say, I want to walk forward three feet. And at the same time as that, I want to lift my arm. I want to start lifting my arm to flip a switch. And then once I accomplish my walking forward and lifting my arm, now I want to flip the switch. So those that would be a command group where we have a series of commands. Some of them can run in parallel. So the, the big takeaway from this slide is that a command is what the program should do, not how it should do it. And then the subsystems, that's where we think about how are we going to actually do the work. So it's an object that encapsulates the hardware that operates together. So a really simple example is a drivetrain. That's where you're going to start. Your robot is, I just need to drive it around on the ground, not worrying about anything other than the wheels, really. So the drivetrain knows about the motor controllers. It knows how many motors are on each wheel. It knows whether you're a tank drive or a mechanum drive and how to how to run the motors to make the operation happen. So the command would say, I need to drive forward. The sub, it would call the subsystem to do that. The subsystem then knows, well, that means I need to run these six motors. These three run forward, these three run backward. And that's how I actually get the task done. And a subsystem can only be used by one command or command group at a time. So 
that makes sense because I wouldn't want to say I want to drive forward and drive backward at the same time. One of those has to have control. Or um, an example would be on our robot for the 2020-2021 is it uses the drivetrain to point the robot at the target to throw the ball. So when I'm targeting, I need to have control of the drivetrain. I can't have the the driver moving the drivetrain around. So we want to make sure that subsystems are only used by one command at a time. And the command scheduler is the part of what's built into WPI Live that does that for us. So that's where we can, if we create our command groups and we schedule them, it will then make sure that our command group has all of the subsystems that it needs, cancels any commands that we're using it, and then runs our commands and, and releases it when we're finished. So the command scheduler is what actually makes sure that we're only running one at a time, and that's how we make commands run. So now let's actually just dig into Visual Studio Code and try making a project and see kind of what it looks like. So like I said before, we click on this button up here to open up our list of commands. What we're gonna do is create a new project. We're gonna create a robot project since we're starting from scratch. So that brings up a wizard. And I'm gonna just close that so we can see a little bit more. The first choice is, do you wanna use an example or a template? So they have provided a bunch of examples that are um, working for some given hardware to do certain tasks, or you can have a template. So if I just wanna use I just know what I want to build, but I need to use WPI Lab. I can say, I want to use a template. It just creates the right files and a couple of things, and then I can plug my stuff in. Or if I want a full working example, I can use the example option. And we'll use example because we're going to kind of poke around some code that they have in there. And then you can do C++ or Java. We're doing Java. And then it gives you a list of the examples. And it gives you a little bit of description. There's more description out in the documentation if you want to look at that, kind of at what the examples are. But we'll use the traditional Hatchbot. So this one, it's a command-based Hatchbot for the 2019 game. Uh, the 2019 game is what I've got pictured on my uh, background behind me. <laughs> we had these hatches and these hatch panels that the robot had to pick up and put onto uh, Velcro, basically put them up on the wall. So the Hatchbot example is a robot that can do that. Next, I just have to select where do I want to save it. Um, something that tricks up our kids sometimes is they save it into their shared drive at school instead of on the local machine. And when you are programming, you, you're going to program here, so I need my files available. And then I'm going to connect to the robot. When I connect to the robot, I usually do that by changing my Wi-Fi network, and then I can't get to the files anymore. So it's usually a good idea to do it on your local machine if you can, on your C drive. But it, it's not entirely required, but it's probably a good idea. So just select a folder where you want to save it. And then we give the project a name. So I'm just going to call it Hatch Example. Um, this box is, do I want to create a new folder called hatch example inside of the folder that I selected? I do want to do that. Then enter your team number, ours is 7028. And I'm going to check this box. I think this is going to be the default in the future that you, oh, this box is always checked by default. This just says, I may want to use the simulator. I may not only want to do it on a robot. So you have to check that box. And then once I click Generate Project, it asks me, do you want to open this right now? You can open it in this window. You can launch a new window, or you can go back. So I'm going to launch it right in this window. So now, once it loads up here, we'll see over here now we have files where we previously had the message telling us we can open a project. And now we can see in the status bar, there was, now it disappeared, but there was a spinner saying activating extensions. It's still loading some stuff. And I can see, yeah, here's the other spinner down here in this corner, in the bottom right corner. 
it's loading and we can see some stuff happening in this terminal window. It's now going to try to build the code that we have in our project. So while that's running, we can still go look around. So this SRC, that's short for source, that's the folder where you're going to find your source code. Uh, the main folder and then Java, as you expand these, it'll expand out. And you see we have a subsystems folder and a commands folder. That should be familiar from what we were talking about before. We have commands and subsystems in a command-based robot. We put the different classes into these different folders. And then the robot container is kind of our main class where we wire everything together. There is a robot class, but we usually don't have to touch that. That's where um, there's just kind of some template code in there. So robot container is where you would want to do um, wiring up uh, all of your commands and your subsystems. So let's actually look at the drive subsystem. And this is still building in the background. So it's a little bit slow as it does that. But so one of the things that's interesting, once you have a file open, we have a class here. It's the drive subsystem class. And it has a number of methods and uh, fields inside of it. There's an outline down here that I can expand in the bottom left. And it's still loading right now. But once that loads, it'll show a list of all of the um, all of the fields and methods, which is kind of handy to be able to navigate around. So the drive subsystem is what knows about the motors. We talked about that. So here we have the actual motors. So this uh, drivetrain must have two motors on the left side and two motors on the right side. So they've created two speed control groups for those motors. And then it must be a tank drive. They're using this differential drive class and passing those in. And then it also knows about the encoders. The encoders are the sensors that you put on your drivetrain to know how many times the wheels have turned so that I know what distance I've traveled. So there's an encoder on the left side and an encoder on the right side. So this is the class where it, it knows about the sensors, the motors, how the drivetrain is configured. And then it provides a couple methods, very few, but how to actually make something happen. So arcade drive is um, driving on an Xbox controller where I'm using one stick uh, forward and backward, and I'm using another to, to rotate is the way that I think of it. So they provide this class to call, uh, this method to call on the class, and then it knows, okay, if you want to go forward, I need to run the motors in this configuration. If you want to spin, I need to run the motors in this configuration. So then we've got a command. The one they have here is drive distance. It is kind of interesting. So this would be an autonomous that drives forward a given distance. So when you construct it, you tell it how far do you want to drive and what speed, and you have to give it the drive subsystem because it, it needs to drive that drivetrain. We say that it's required. That means when I'm running, nobody else can have control of it. And when this, um, when this command first runs, it's initialized method runs, and it's going to reset the encoders to zero, and then it's going to start driving at the speed that we asked it to drive, and it's going to drive straight forward. This was rotation. It's not going to rotate. It's only going to drive forward. And then our command, every 50 milliseconds, WPI Live will call our command again to say, what do you want to do now? And so execute is what it will call. And so we're going to say, we want to continue driving forward until our command is done. So WPI Live then calls is finished to ask you, is your command done? And so here it says, how far have those encoders turned? And has that been far enough to exceed the distance that you told me I wanted to go? And if it is, then I return true. So now. Once I've driven that given distance, WPI Lab says, okay, this command is done. I'm going to call the end method just so you can wrap it up. And the arcade, we use arcade drive to then say, we want to stop. 
because we've driven that given distance. So I don't expect that you'll understand every bit of code that we looked at so far, but the takeaway is the drivetrain subsystem knows about those motors and those encoders. The drive command really only knows how fast you want to drive and that you want to drive until you've reached a given distance. And when you get there, you want to stop. So that kind of shows us that separation between the subsystem and the command. And then the default drive, they have this default drive command. This would be the one that runs when you're in teleoperated mode. Uh, no, this isn't, is it? Let's see. Yes, okay. So they're, yep, the, they have a supplier for how fast they wanna drive forward and their rotation. And then they get this over and over again and it drives that distance. So um, what's more interesting though is this complex auto. That was the one that we wanted to look at. So this one is a command group that does more than one thing. So this in the code that they have as an example, this would be their whole autonomous function. They can drive forward a set distance, then they can release a hatch panel and then they drive backwards. So in in 2019, you started up on a ledge with a hatch panel, uh, this one here, right in front of you. And so the robot could drive forward a set distance. And then whatever the, however this mechanism lets go of the hatch panel, because it's expecting that it's now stuck to the Velcro, it lets go of it, and then the robot backs up. So this uses the drive distance command twice, and we have it driving a set distance forward and backward. So it drives forward five feet, it looks like, and then drives backward 20 inches. And they just have a constant speed of 50%. And then this release hatch panel is another command that uses the hatch subsystem to release it. And you know what's interesting here is it's, it's pretty well defined that, oh, this is gonna release a hatch panel and it uses the hatch subsystem. I don't really care how it actually works. And if I do, I can go look at the subsystem. But when I'm putting these pieces together, I don't need to know that. But this is where commands come, you know, really the power of the commands comes in is in your autonomous function. So any questions so far, you can go ahead and put them in the chat and then we'll move on. So next, I was going to talk a little bit about the robot simulator. And this was more important last year when we had COVID going on and we couldn't necessarily get into our shop. How can I write code when I don't have access to a robot? It's also helpful, especially like a rookie team. I, don't, I didn't have a robot the first year. How do, I, how do I program? Or if I want to start you know, with something new at the beginning of the build season, even a lot of times the programmers don't have access to a robot. So the simulator allows us to run the code on our local machine. And it also has some dynamics for how to simulate mechanisms. So it has built in uh, simulation for an elevator. Uh, this robot over here, the 3244 has an elevator. Uh, it's something that you know just goes up and down uh, linear. And so our dynamics that we can um, simulate is the gravity going up and, and down. It can simulate an arm, which this 7028 R robot here from 2019 has an arm. The hatch panel is up on here and then this arm swings downward. So that has a different dynamic because you know when you're fully upright, you don't have gravity pulling down on it. And as you start to swing down, then gravity starts to pull on it. So that's different from an elevator just in the way that gravity interacts with it. It can simulate a flywheel, which is what we have over in the bottom right. Um, that was our prototype from 2020, where we have a wheel spinning here, and then we're gonna we're gonna load a ball to hit that, and that's how we throw the ball. But spinning the flywheel, we can simulate those dynamics. 
and then also a differential drive, which is just you know a tank drive robot. And you can use it to simulate battery draw. So you can use that to help figure out what is your draw gonna look like on a real robot. So now let's actually jump in and see what the simulator looks like. So I'm gonna create another new project because they have a, a good example for how to use the simulator. I'm gonna create, I'm gonna use another example, Java. And this one is called Arm Simulation. Arm Simulation. I'll just call my project arm sim, create a new folder, 7028. And now because I'm going to use the simulator, I definitely need to check this box. And I can generate my project in the current window. So we'll see, now we've got that activating extensions again. We'll get the spinner down here. The terminal is going to pop up. While it's doing that, I'm going to jump ahead because I I looked at this before and I found that this uses a joystick and I have an Xbox controller. So I need to look in here. We've got a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, Jamie's asking, what do you use for version control? Sure. Our team uses GitHub. We were we reached out to GitHub and they since we're a nonprofit, we got a free account that even has some added features, but you can use GitHub um, for free. It's a great tool. That's what we use. I think there was a presentation on that last week, possibly, but definitely we're big believers in committing our code frequently. We started to use a little bit for reviews to have, you know, once we get kind of in a solid state that we want to send out a review before we merge something in. So GitHub is great for that. And there's a little bit of documentation on the WPI live documentation about how to get started. And they do talk about GitHub on there too. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So here's our joystick. I just need to change that. And I can see down here, it did build successfully. So this is something that you want to watch for is that build successful down there. But I don't have my autocomplete and stuff just yet. It's still loading, but it should work in a second here. I'm using the wrong keys. There we go. All There we go, now my autocomplete is working. It took a second to load. There we go, I have my B in uppercase and it's supposed to be lowercase. And then down here where it's reading, it was reading from the trigger on the joystick Instead, I'm going to use the A button on my Xbox controller. All right, so now we can run the simulation and see what that looks like. So I click on that button up on the top again, and then I can, I can type up here to get it to filter down, and I'm going to simulate robot on desktop. And now we can watch down here again as it builds it, make sure that we get that build successful. And then this will pop up the first time. We have to use this top one, the sim GUI. We have to check that DLL. And then I think that'll stick in your project from when you run it from now on. And now it is launching. All 
All right, so this is my simulator window. So here I have my robot state. So we talked about that. We have disabled, autonomous, teleop. Uh, we didn't talk about the test mode. That is another mode that you can use on the bench to run in a special mode. Um, and you can click on this to change your robot into those different modes. So it shows you what it is, but it's also the selector. And then you can get different hardware by clicking on up here, and then you get a menu of the different things that are available. So this one I know has some digital inputs and outputs. It has some encoders. So when I open that up, I can see my encoders. can also see my pulse width modulation output. So this one has a motor for running the arm. And so my pulse width modulation output is here. And I can also see a window with my encoders. So this one here, it just kind of shows me what my encoders are. Here, it really shows me you know, all the data that I see from my encoder, which is great. So now if I want to drive it with an Xbox controller or a joystick, we have this joysticks down here, and we have system joysticks over here. The system joysticks shows me all of the joysticks that it found connected. And over here are the ones that I have configured. So I have to drag and drop from there over here. And then because I have an Xbox controller, I have to check this map gamepad that tripped me up the first time. And I had, had to ask for help on how to get that. Because if it's a controller, it didn't work right. If you have a joystick, you uncheck that box. And now that I have that mapped and I have that checked, when I move things around on my Xbox controller or push buttons, I can see they light up in the simulator. It shows it moving and lighting up. So that's kind of like what you can see in the in the drive station too. We've got another question here in the chat. Andy, um, Riley's asking, how do you access the simulator? Sure, the way we got the simulator to open was by in our project, we had to click on that WPI lib and then do simulate robot code on desktop. So you can't run it by itself. You have to run it with some code in it. So that's the way to open it up. All right, and then let's see, if we put the robot in teleop mode and we push the A button, it's gonna simulate moving the arm and holding it in a position. So it's not super interesting to see, but that's the idea. So I'm gonna put it in teleop and I'm gonna push the A button. And now I can see that I'm, it's simulating the output on the motor. And when I let go, it's gonna go down to zero. So the arm would come down, it's at zero. And now when I push it, when I first push it, you see it spikes way up. I don't know how fast it refreshes for you guys, but I can see it spiking up to like 0 0.9, 0 0.7. And then when I hold it, it holds at about 0.25. So that's simulating that it's gonna take extra power to get the arm to lift and to get it started. And then once I'm holding, it just holds a pretty constant level. So that's part of the dynamics that it's simulating. And then over here, we can also see that it's simulating our encoders moving and reading the input from our arm, that the arm is moving up and down. So there's a lot of documentation on how to use the simulator. Um, I had a more advanced demo where you can also show a field and you can drive your robot around on the field, but we're not gonna have enough time to look at that. But um, you can do things like that when you get more advanced and you have your autonomous mode and you can you want to drive a path you can actually show it driving on kind of a layout of the field so the simulator comes in handy but it's always best if you can get access to the real robot so try to get those build people out of there early so that you can get access to it so That is everything I have. I just have a couple links at the end of the presentation that are helpful. We have uh, the documentation from FRC. You might think, oh, docs, that's boring, but they actually have a lot of really good stuff out there. It describes all of the different components of a robot, how to get the project started, where to download everything, all the way up to advanced topics about how to get your robot to drive a fixed path, um, things like that. And then these last three are links to documentation for different vendors. Um, a lot of times your motor controllers are either made by CTRE, Cross the Road Electronics, or Spark. 
um, by Rev Robotics, they're Spark Maxes. So these are links for where to get more information about those and how to do some more advanced things. And Navex is a common gyro. So just have kind of a few links on there that you can use. So any other questions? If you do have a question, you can also come off of mute. You're free to do that. Oh, looks like everybody's good. All right. All right. Great. Thank you, Andy. That was interesting for me, certainly.